first just want to start off this kind of this pre-draft thing and just kind of thank some people. Uh, certainly our medical staff, huge part of what we do. Um, a lot of tireless work by those guys. Our coaches have done a nice job with what we've asked them to do. And then obviously, certainly um, our scouts. Um, really can't say enough about those guys, the, the time away from their families, uh, how, how much time they put in, the effort. Um, and this is just such an important part of building our football team. So just want to thank those guys before we get to the questions. Brian, what did you like about Sammy Watkins to bring him in? I think, obviously, uh, Sammy's had a pretty good history. Um, you know, in this league, uh, he's got some juice still left in him, you know, I think. I think uh, adding a veteran receiver was just kind of something we wanted to do. Are you still in the market, whether it be free agency or trade, for potentially another veteran wide receiver? I think uh, across the board at every position. I think we're kind of looking at everything right now. Um, so I think it's, uh, this draft's going to be really important, and then we'll see where we sit kind of after the draft, and we'll move forward at that point. <laughs> yeah, we're, I think we're kind of getting down to it. You know, I think there's certainly some, you know, some, you know, situational conversations. Um, you know, Matt and I will get together tomorrow and kind of work through some things. But really, I think over the weekend, we got very comfortable with the board where we were at. And, um, you know, just, you know, try not to, to make a mistake at the last minute here. We've seen you do a lot of trades on draft day. Um, it, does the groundwork for that get laid now in the week going up? Is that more of a draft night thing? And mm -hmm. when you've got the ammunition at the top of the draft that you, you have, do, are you more likely to, to trade? Do you feel more empowered to do that? Yeah, I think the first part of your question, I think there's yeah, a lot of conversations over the last week. Um, certainly there'll be some more in the next couple of days. But uh, it'd be nice you know, to have some of those things ironed out before you got into it. But that's not always the way it works. Um, you know, having having more picks kind of in the top three rounds than we've had in a while, um, I think it, it's there's probably temptations on both sides to to move around a little bit or just to sit and pick as well. So um, we'll kind of see what's available, and I think a lot of it's just going to be how the how the draft falls. But it is the, some of the conversations this week are just trying to kind of set things up to see what what availability we have to move up or down. Hey Brian, with the um first or the fifth year options for Rashawn Gary and Savage. What's mm -hmm. the plan there? And is there any point that, you know, with these guys and with the way the cap is and just doing long term extensions, is it, you know, more cost effective than doing, you know, guy playing on that fifth year? Yeah, obviously, you know, both those players have done a nice job since they've been here and we're excited about their futures and um, we'll kinda of get to that when the you know after the draft when that decision uh, is upon us. But uh, um, I think I think you're kind of referring to like trying to do extensions with with a couple of years left is is what you're more talking about. Yeah, is that, is that my, a year now or even those guys. Right. right yeah. Now. And I think again, I think we'll get through this draft weekend and we'll go down that road with with some of those players. With the with the seventh round picks you have having multiple ones, how much are you going to be looking at special team skills? How much do you prioritize that when you get to that point in the draft? And will it be any more so than in any typical year? Yeah, I think probably not a lot different than in, in most typical years. At the same time, I think Rich has been you know heavily involved, like the coaches always are, with, with some of that stuff. I do think uh, in the kind of the, the third day of the draft, uh, when you start looking at the areas where guys potentially could make your football team, that's certainly a big part of it. Um, so as we move forward here, I think that'll that'll be a big part of the conversation. You still look at a competition for each position before you take that step and consider special teams. Are you talking about within the special teams yeah. groups or yeah, or just in the uh, offense, and defense, general? Saturday picks. I mean, are you looking at guys who compete in their position group and then yeah. consider the special teams? Thing? Yeah, I think, you know, there are, there are some players in the National Football League that don't do much other than special teams, um, you know, outside of the punter, kicker, and snapper. Um, there's not a ton of them. Um, certainly, we would like them to have a role uh, somewhere on the football team, offensively or defensively. Um, but that... We wouldn't close the door on someone um, if they you know, had the ability to be an elite special teams player, um, but maybe not a role on offense or defense. Every draft's important, obviously. Mm -hmm. To say this one's important is kind of obvious, but when you look at what you've lost this offseason and, and the picks that you do have, is this maybe kind of a little more important than, than in any regular years? It's kind of a foundational draft for you. Yeah, I understand the question, Ron. I think not really. I think this is uh, every draft is so important to your football team. Uh, it is the lifeblood of how we build our football team. Um, so um, the amount of um, you know, resources and energy that we put into this is reflective of that. You know? um, so I, I don't know if it's any different than any other year, but it's, it's you know, significantly important for us. 
um, as we move forward. So it's um, it always kind of has been that way here. Um, but I'm excited about the team we got coming back. I mean, having the guys in the building uh, these last couple of days, just the energy and and seeing some of the faces, it's um, you know you start getting excited about our team and, and what we got what got coming from, you know in front of us. Brian, um, there's a lot of older guys in this draft just because of the COVID year. I mean, there's some guys who be 25 years old for the right. start of training camp. Does that factor? at all in your picking up players? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's something we haven't seen a lot of over the past five, 10 years, maybe, you know, um, you know, not only um, seeing so many older players in this draft, but then kind of the volume specifically in the bottom of the draft, just with all these guys that came back for an extra year. So yeah, the age factor is, is, is part of the, the equation uh, as we look at it and just kind of, you know, kind of judging the merits of, of what they did in the past, maybe compared to what they did this just past year. Brian, you mentioned, I think, earlier either at the Combine or at um, the owners meeting that you thought that this draft had a lot of talent, both on the offensive line and then defensively. What is it that you're seeing in those position groups that has you excited when you look at that aspect of this year's draft? Yeah, I think this the, you know, the overall you know, there's a depth of the big men in this draft is pretty good. Um, but at the same time, we'll kind of see where those runs start and, and where they fall. But uh, um, I think that, you know, the volume of players um, Again, a lot because of COVID, I think it just pushed push the depth of the draft up a little, maybe a little more than it has been in the past. The last couple of years, we've seen receivers kind of step in and contribute right away, maybe more so than in the past. What do you think about this receiver class, particularly the depth of it? How does it compare to the last couple of years? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a pretty good receiver class, and I think it's, it's uh, the last few have been you know pretty deep, and I think this one is another one. I think it's a product of, of just kind of how these players are coming up through high school and college, you know, how much more they're throwing the ball in college. And then certainly, the, you know, I think seven on seven and uh, some of the flag football, um, you know, youth leagues, these guys have been catching and, and throwing for such a long period of time now, maybe than when I first started scouting. So I think that's probably a little bit of the reason you're seeing some guys excel. At the same time, I think, um, you know, NFL offenses are adjusting to what these guys have done in college and adopting some of that quicker maybe than we had in the past. Um, but history still kind of shows that uh, for all rookies, not just wide receivers, but for all rookies, it takes time. And this is a hard league, and there's a, there's a learning curve before these guys really start to produce at a high level. You mentioned what are the challenges of, of hitting on wide receivers and tight ends? Are there different challenges with them because of the variables of their offense or the quality of quarterback they play with or whatever? And how do you kind of think you've done in your four years as a staff? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, you know, I think, you know, the tight end position has always been one of the toughest ones because it's just of you have to know the whole offense, right? The, the run game, uh, the blocking schemes, and, the, and certainly the passing game as well. Um, I do think that when guys come, you know, where they come from and what they've been exposed to has, you know, um, a significant um, impact on how maybe they come into the league, you know, and how quickly they're, they get up to speed. Um, but, you know, I think around here, you guys know, I mean, you, you know our history here with, with receivers specifically um, in the second round and stuff. So I think that's always part of the equation. Um, I think it's, it's a really good, and Ted always used to say, it's you got to have some pass catchers around here. And that, whether that's tight ends, running backs, receivers, you know, you got to have guys who can catch, catch the ball. So I think um, certainly that's a big part of, of how we look to build our team. But I, I, think, I do think the guys that come from more pro-ready systems have it a little bit easier. But um, again, like we talk about a lot, and I know you guys have heard me say this, um, our you know, philosophy on the draft is very much a long-term decision, not short-term. Hey Brian, how much more do you get out of the 30 player visits than you say you get at mm -hmm. the combine interview? Well, we get a full day with them, which is nice. You know, and I think we get to have um, a lot of different people in our organization um, spend time with them than, than we do at the combine. So I think it's, you know, we certainly would love to have more opportunities than 30, but at the same time, um, the guys we do bring in, it's, uh, I think we, you know, we feel certainly much better about um, knowing those players once they leave here. So we're pretty selective about the guys we bring in. There's you know, multiple components to that, whether it be uh, getting to know them better, the person, and, um, or maybe medical or you know, intelligence, things like that. There's a lot of different reasons why we bring players in. You mentioned seeing where the runs out of position start when they, mm -hmm. when they end. Is there an art to that, to, to knowing, to, be, to being ready for when that begins beyond just knowing the needs of the teams ahead of you? I think it's just, you know, being prepared for all the scenarios that can possibly happen. You know, I think um, you really can't predict it. You know, you can, um, you know, especially like in the middle rounds, it's really tough to predict the runs and where they're going to go. I think at the top of the draft, 
uh, there's a little bit more predictability, but we've always kind of been picking later. So it's been, um, it's a lot less predictable back there, obviously. And um, so I think it's just kind of being able to pivot and understand when it's happening, what you might need to do um, to accomplish our goals. Do you do internal mocks or anything like that? We don't really do internal mocks. We just we do go over scenarios, and we wouldn't. I wouldn't. We've never done like you know mock draft type simulation, um, but we do go over a ton of scenarios of, of what could happen. You know, throughout the the um, really the entire you know three days. Brian, have you or will you talk to Aaron about kind of the direction you guys are going to go on draft night? You know what? Our pretty constant communication with with Aaron. Um, this is his downtime, so you know he. Uh, I don't know he enjoys that. Um, but yeah, again, the specifics with what we talk about, I won't get into. But um, it's uh, obviously carried over from what we've been doing for the last year and a half or so. Since your board's uh, pretty much finished up, mm -hmm. how many first round <clears throat> first round grades do you have? You know what? We don't. Uh, that's not really our process. We don't have a round grade on, on players. So um, that's not how we go about it. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a hard, hard question to answer. Thank you. So if you don't mind me asking that, there was one time when Ted was there mm -hmm. and he like walked away from the podium, which was tough for the broadcast. Media, <laughs> and he like kind of outlined the board and he said yeah. he, had, he got positions across the top right. and he had the rounds down the side and then yeah. he had the grades. And, so how have you kind of altered it now that it's... Yeah, it's a, it's a little different now. I mean, it's, it's, it, there's a vertical stacking and then there's the horizontal kind of stacking, you know, so to speak. And I think pretty much every team goes through it some way or another. Um, so I think we spend majority of the time getting, you know, positionally vertically, you know, the way we, we think it, we, it should be and how we like it. And then you start going across, you know, comparing positions, guys at different positions and stuff. And that's really the last two weeks or so is where we've been at, um, kind of in the phase process. But, uh, um, that's it. It's really it's no different. It's just we don't like when we give grades to players. It's just it's not a round grade, yeah. So. So speaking of Ted, you know he used to talk a lot about letting the board come to you, mm -hmm. and you obviously worked with him for a long time, and he was very patient. And yeah. Traded back a lot. You have not been afraid to say, hey, this is a guy that I want to go get. Or mm -hmm. um, how? What's that decision making process like? And and are would you say you're more likely to? Say there's a guy that you really want to go get, or, or do you want to be a little more patient like he was? Yeah, I'd like to be a little more patient like 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 he was. But at the same time, if and it's funny how history can kind of, but you know people remember when he went and got Clay. You know, I mean he he certainly would have his players that he would see and he would go get them if he if he wanted to. So, um, but uh, I think you know it's you got to be careful of falling in love with players, right? Um, because then you start chasing things and, and getting out of whack value-wise and, and stuff. But um, So you'd love for it to come to you, but at the same time, I think you have to be realistic about where you're picking and um, where the strength of the draft is. And if it, if it makes sense to move to a particular area to help your football team, I think you have to be willing to do that. And is, it, is it more an area where you have a, a cluster of guys that you could like when you traded up the 26 a couple of years ago, I don't know if you were intentionally saying just for Jordan, no. or, was, or was it more of a, there's a couple of guys I could really like. Mm -hmm. I think when you, specifically in the first round, um, when you're trading up, uh, it's usually for a specific player. Um, I, well, I don't want to say that for everybody, but, for, but I think in my history and, and my experience, it's usually for a particular player. Um, but there's always, um, in any trade, whether you're trading up or back, there's, there's usually different picks attached to it. I think having an understanding of where you feel the where the board is strong, which area is strong, where your num what do your numbers say, um, is important. And there's it's been months of analysis of these guys. I mean, mm -hmm. how do you view kind of between now and Thursday the misinformation <laughs> that comes out? Do you find it amusing? Yeah. Is it annoying? Yeah. How do you just kind of stay on task? Um, you know, it's it was it's more amusing now than than probably what it used to be when you know, when Ted was here. I was. I was the one that had to track all that down, you know, and make sure, you know. So it was, it was not, I'm not doing that as much anymore. Maybe somebody else is. So uh, that was really annoying, you know, because you knew it wasn't, you know, you'd, you'd done all this work and you felt really confident. Uh, still, you had to do the due diligence because there are things that do pop up late. But um, I think you got to trust your work. You know, Ted and Ron, everybody, we always have a saying in the draft room, let's know what we know and know what we don't know. And you have to be honest about that when you're in there. And if there's things you don't know, you don't know. And you have to be able to move on and pass if you don't know. So, um, you know, when we get to this point, it's kind of, you know, speak now or forever hold your 
you know, so. Back, back to the COVID year, um, can you hazard a guess about how many more players are on your board this year compared to like last year and pre prior years? Is it significantly more? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, everybody looked, you know, has front boards, back boards, all that stuff. But I would say we, we've spent a lot of time the last week and a half kind of sending it out a little bit. Um, but I mean, at one point, I think we were, you know, I want to give a number to it, but we were significantly higher than we had been totally, you know. Um, and I think, um, which is a good thing, you know, that's a great thing, especially in the UDFA area, you know. I think we were much higher there. I think the top of the draft was pretty, pretty similar uh, to years past, but, um, you know, those later rounds in the UDFA, our numbers were, were very high. Good time for two more. Hey, Cody, um, you know, the draft industrial complex has focused very much on the wide receiver thing for you guys. For a while now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At least since March 17th. <laughs> um, and, and we've all written about or talked about yeah. the challenges for rookies. The one difference, I think, this time around is like when Devontae comes in, Jordy's your clear cut number one. Right. You know, and, and there just isn't that, no matter how much you like Randall or Allen. They haven't established themselves the way those guys have. So how does that change your dynamic on how you're going to build that position? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I think uh, we've got a pretty good quarterback, and that helps, you know, <laughs> significantly. So, um, you know, I think certainly there's going to be probably more opportunity for that young player if we happen to go that route to come in and, and have some opportunities, you know. So, um, you know, it's not something that around here that we've had a, a lot of that. You know, I think uh, I think way back early in my career, we drafted Javon, you know, with the first pick. And I think it was about middle of year two where he just took off, you know. Um, and then for about a year and a half there, he was playing as, about as good as anyone. So um, that was kind of the rule of thumb back then. You know, it took about a year and a half to really get into where they knew what was going on. I think, again, hopefully it'll be quicker um, if, we, if we go that route this year. But... Um, yeah, I think to your point, I think um, when when Tay came in, certainly having those guys ahead of him was a challenge for him to, to get the opportunities. Or maybe this time um, it won't be as big of a challenge. But I will say we've got some pretty good players in the building that uh, I think are very eager for their opportunity, which maybe they haven't had yet. Given the report, Brian, if I could kind of follow up on what Jason asked, is it um, better to have you know, a rookie receiver, maybe have those guys to learn from and sit back and watch like some of those guys did when they came in? Or is it just better to go play? Uh, I think it could go either way. You know, I think it probably depends on that player, you know, um, his experience and kind of his work ethic and, and all that that goes into that. Um, I've always felt having, you know, guys, when young players come in, it's one of the things I tell them through this draft process when I'm talking to some of these college guys or when we get guys in here for the first time is to find a guy on the team that you respect and that has done it the right way, that has survived in this league, whether it be in your position room or whether it be outside of your position room and, and just get in there, you know, on their hip and, and, and try to learn everything you can from them. Because it's one thing, you know, to hear from the coaches and all of us, um, but when a, a guy who's been able to play in this league for a long time, I think the, the wisdom that those guys can give is, is, is priceless. Given the dynamic at receiver, the fact mm -hmm. there isn't a clear leader, established guy in, in that room that's, that's done it in this offense, um, do, do you need Aaron to be more involved? The offseason program that he's yeah. been in. Yeah, you know, I would push back a little bit. I mean, obviously, Randall's been very established in this offense, and he's you know been around with Aaron for a long time. Um, you know, certainly, Allen's been here for a few years now too. So, um, we've got some guys that are established, and Sammy's had obviously not. He hasn't been here, but um, he's been in the league for a long time. Um, but Aaron's going to be heavily involved in the development of not only players that are in our building right now, but certainly whoever we bring in.